Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on protecting your business's intellectual property. My name is Harman Jock Kaur, and I'm an associate in Legal Vision's corporate and commercial team. I'm joined today by my colleague, Seidel Hack, who is an associate in our employment team. Before we begin, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, you will be emailed the webinar recording and slides after this chat, so you don't need to frantically take notes, but of course, feel free to do so. Um, there will be a chat box where you can submit your questions, so please pop any questions in there during the webinar and then we can answer them towards the end. Um, and following the webinar, there will be a sur survey that pops up on your screen. Please take a few seconds to complete that, it would be really helpful for us. Also, all attendees are eligible to receive a free consultation with us to discuss how we can help you with your IP or any of your legal needs. To request your free consultation, provide us with your contact details in the survey that appears at the end of this webinar. So today we will be discussing registering your intellectual property, protecting IP through your business structure, IP created by employees and contractors, IP clauses in commercial contracts, and then we'll go into some Q&A. So let's get into it. Um, before we start chatting about registering your IP, let's have a quick chat about what is IP. Intellectual property, which we'll refer to as IP throughout this webinar, is the intangible property in the things that you create. So this could be a product you invent, an article or a song that you write, or something that you design. It can include things like your logo or any specific slogans associated with your brand or any software code that you write. Your IP is what will make your business unique and where a lot of the value in your business is. So it's important to make sure that it's protected. Some IP rights are registrable, such as by way of a trademark or a patent, which we'll discuss in more detail shortly. Some IP rights, such as copyright or trade secrets, cannot be registered, but they're still important to have. Your favorite book, for example, cannot be protected by a registrable form of IP, but it is protected by copyright, so not all is lost. Similarly, your website can't be registered, but it is protected by copyright. In the UK, copyright vests automatically on creation of any creative works. However, it can be difficult to enforce in practice, as you will need to prove that you are the original creator of the works and the date on which you created the work, and that that came before someone else that copied you. So it's important to register any IP that can be registered and protect any IP that can't be registered in other ways. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Seidel, who's going to run through some practical ways of protecting your IP. Thank you, Hami. So we're going to talk, first of all, about trademarks. So a trademark is effectively something that can be used to distinguish the goods or services of one trader from those of another. And they can come in many forms, including things like words, phrases, logos and sounds as well. There are, however, some limitations in what you can register. For instance, you cannot attempt to register a mark that is offensive, misleading, or one that is too common and non-distinctive. The whole purpose behind, and the main purpose behind a trademark, is to enable prospective customers to recognize your goods or services from those of another and to protect your brand identity. In the UK, there are no qualification requirements to register a mark, so long as the applicant is a natural or legal person, and trademark registrations and applications are all administered by the UK Intellectual Property Office, also known as the IPO. Now, before applying to register a trademark, it is wise to make a search of the intellectual property register on the, on the IPO's website. The purpose behind that is to check that the mark you want to register is not already in use or to check there are no similar marks. Once this stage is complete and if the mark is not in use or if there are no similar marks, you can seek to make an application to register your mark. Now to register your mark, what you need to do is prepare and submit an application either online or via an official form to the IPO. And that will also be along with a relevant fee as well. So there is always gonna be a fee payable to the intellectual property office when registering mark. Typically you're looking at a cost of at least 170 pounds, but it may be more than this depending on how many goods or services that you want to protect your brand in. And the information that you'll need to submit your application will include things like the details of the mark. So for example, an image of the mark itself, if you've got a logo, um, details of the applicant, so the name, status, country of incorporation, and the address as well, and a statement of the goods or services for which the protection is sought. This is also known as a specification of goods or services. 
Now, once you submit your application to the IPO, you will receive an official filing receipt, which is basically evidence of your application. And this receipt will also set out key parts or app of your application and set out the application number and the filing date as well. The IPO will then check that your mark meets the eligibility requirements under Trademarks Act 1994 and whether the mark is the same as or similar to an existing mark. If there are no issues, the IPO will, the IPO will then publish the details of your application to the Trademark Journal and that will potentially allow third parties to oppose your application and that opposition period will last for approximately two months and it may be extended by up to a further month by any opposing parties if there are any. If there are any issues, then what will happen is that the IPO will contact you and possibly halt the registration of your mark until that issue is resolved. But if there are no issues, then your trademark will then be registered by the IPO. And this process in total can take up to four months to be completed. But once it is all completed, um, then your mark will be registered and you receive a certificate from the IPO uh, with that confirmation. Your trademark will then last for 10 years and can be renewed for further successive periods, subject to payment of a renewal fee to the IPO as well. Moving on then to patents. So patents are an intellectual property right that grant invented certain rights to prevent third parties from using their invention. With patent protection, it doesn't arise automatically and therefore you cannot, for example, patent an idea. Additionally, you cannot patent the way that information is presented the way that software has a non-technical purpose and a way of doing business amongst other things. Now, in order to have patent protection, there is a variety of things that you need to do. First off, you'll need to submit an application for a patent and be granted that application as well. And to have patent protection, there is a criteria that you need to meet. For example, your invention must be new, it must involve an innovative step, and it must be capable of industrial application and not be excluded from protection as a patent under the Patents Act 1977. Now, obtaining a patent is complex, and in order to seek protection, you have to submit that application again to the IPO with details of your invention, along with any supporting documents as well. And then again, you have to pay the relevant fee to the IPO. Similarly to trademarks, the IPO will then consider your application and carry out searches and check whether your patent is capable of registration and carry out a substantive examination of your invention. And this process can in fact take several years compared to a trademark, which can take um, you know, around four months or so. Now, if your patent is granted, it will then be published in its final form and you'll be sent a certificate. And then after this, you must renew that patent uh, on its fourth anniversary and then every single year for up to 20 years as well. Now, if after you have registered your trademark, you find evidence of your mark being infringed or being misused without your consent, you will have various options that you can undertake. So for example, if the sign used by the infringer is identical to or similar to your registered trademark and used in relation to goods or services which are identical or similar to yours, the, per the burden of proof would initially be on you to demonstrate that the infringing party's use of an identical or similar mark would cause a public general public that is, confusion or association with your registered mark. Now, once you've discharged that burden, you would potentially be able to pursue infringement proceedings. Patent infringement also follows a similar path, but here there are two types of infringement. The so first one is direct infringement, where steps are taken directly in relation to patented products or processes. And then there's indirect infringement as well where steps are taken indirectly in relation to patented products or processes. Now, to establish whether there has been an infringement of some sort, it is necessary to demonstrate that the invention is protected by a patent or you have an application for it. And in terms of the activities or the infringing parties, it falls within the legal definition of an infringement under the Patents Act 1977. And then they have to also consider whether there's any sort of exceptions or legal defenses available to the infringing parties. It is always wise when it comes to patent infringement or trademark infringement that you write to the third party and see if we can reach some sort of amicable resolution without the need for any sort of escalation because at the end of the day, it's gonna cost a lot of money and it's gonna um, also incur a lot of time being wasted on these types of matters where it might be better served in your day-to-day -day business. So sometimes a letter just simply setting out the alleged infringement by the third party 
and setting up the steps that you require them to take would prevent litigation. But if this process isn't successful, then you do always have the option to consider whether litigation is necessary. So I'm going to pass you now back to my colleague, Hami, who will talk to you about protecting your IP for your business structure. Thanks, Idol. Um, so as we discussed before, not all IP can be registered. So let's touch now on how to protect any IP that cannot be registered. Having the correct business structure in place is important to manage your risk as a business generally, but it can also be used um, as an important tool in protecting your intellectual property, both registered or registrable and unregistered. A dual company structure is a good tool to use here. Typically in a dual company structure, the shareholders will hold shares in a holding company or otherwise known as a parent company. And the holding company will be a 100% owner of the subsidiary or the operating company. <clears throat> the operating company will, for all intents and purposes, be the company that actually carries on the business. It will enter into the contracts with customers and suppliers and supply the goods and, or perform the services. The holding company will simply hold assets, particularly your IP. The holding company will license this IP to the operating company through what we call an IP license deed, which will give the operating company the right to use the IP. If something goes wrong, a company's liability will not extend to any group companies, and therefore any assets held by the holding company are safe, provided that the holding company was not the party that entered into um, the contract or whether a dispute has arisen. Take a software business, for example. The holding company, ABC Holdings, will own the software and any registered trademarks for the business and, and the website. The operating company, ABC Operations, will receive a license to use the software, the trademarks and the website, and can use these for the purposes of operating the business. Say ABC Operations breaches an agreement it has with one of its suppliers and said supplier makes a claim against ABC Operations. ABC operations liability will be limited to only the assets that that company holds. In this scenario, because the IP is held by ABC Holdings, the supplier can't make any claim against it because their contract was with ABC operations. So therefore that IP is protected regardless of what happens in the dispute between ABC operations and their supplier. Seidel's now gonna take you through protecting IP created by your employees and contractors. Thank you, Hami. So it is important when engaging any employees <coughs> or contractors that you do carefully consider what this could mean for your intellectual property, because generally speaking, anything created in the course of employment belongs automatically to yourself as the employer, and the UK legislation generally favours employers in that sense as well. But to enhance, to enhance protection, however, you can consider various measures, such as a statement of ownership of IP, a contractual obligation to disclose inventions to you from your employees or contractors. You can also consider putting in place a restrictive covenant to apply post-termination and to protect your confidential information and also to prevent solicitation or competition for a period of time. Now, when it comes to departing employees and contractors, what you should always seek to do is remind them of any applicable post-termination restrictions upon their exit. So this could be a reminder of the fact that there are certain clauses in their contract which prevent them from using confidential information that was acquired during their time with yourself, or it could be that they are unable to compete with your business for a period of time. Seeking court protection should always be seen as a last resort, but it may become necessary if informal steps are not successful. When it comes to enforcement, time is of the essence because when seeking to protect your IP rights, and preventing the misuse of your IP rights or confidential information, because any delay in acting can be a bar to any injunctive relief and prevent enforcement. Now, in order to be enable you to seek court protection, you must first ensure that you yourself are not in material breach of the employment contract where the other party is an employee. So where this is the case, then the employee could potentially seek to rescind the contract and all its clauses, including your IP clauses. So an example of a breach could be you know, if you're not paying the employee their wages and they've decided to resign and leave, then potentially that contract you have with them may not be enforceable, including the IP clause. And case law also shows that contractors do not have the same protection. Now, if you've committed no uh, any sort of material breaches at all of the contract, then you can potentially seek to pursue your rights through the civil court as opposed to an employment tribunal. Now, what I'm going to do is seek to pass you back to my colleague, Hami, who will talk you through IP clauses in commercial contracts. 
Thanks, Idol. Um, before I do come on to that, I think we're having some technical difficulties with our slides. Um, we will forward these to you after the webinar, um, so don't be concerned. Um, okay, IP clauses in your commercial contracts. So you've got the right business structure in place, you've registered your trademarks, you've applied for a patent where possible, but what about things like your software or the book that you've written? There's a few things, a few extra things that you can do to protect these forms of IP that can't be registered. Um, the first is to put in place a non-disclosure agreement. An NDA, or otherwise known as a confidentiality deed, can be used to protect your IP when you're still in the early stages of establishing your business and still creating your IP. They're designed to protect parties when they're sharing commercially sensitive information in the course of doing business. For example, let's say you have a new product that you want to bring to the market. It doesn't meet the requirements for a patent, but it is still something that hasn't been seen in the market in the UK before. You want to engage a manufacturer to manufacture that product for you, but of course you want to make sure that the manufacturer doesn't like your idea so much that they decide to create it for themselves. This is where the NDA comes in. An NDA would prohibit the other side, in this case the manufacturer, from using any information that is shared with them, such as your product idea, for any purpose other than your discussions. An NDA will typically set out the purpose for which information is being shared. So in this case, it would be for the purpose of discussing a manufacturing relationship between the parties. Um, and use of any information that's shared under the NDA will typically be, re be restricted to that purpose only. The NDA should also set out how long any confidentiality obligations will survive, who the other side can share information with, for example, their employees or their professional advisors, and what should happen with the confidential information shared if the NDA expires or is terminated. Um, before we chat about what comes after the NDA, it is important to understand um, the difference between a licensing or a, a signing arrangement. <clears throat> IP is typically owned by the person that created it, unless an alternative is specifically agreed between the parties um, or, or unless it's an employee in contract or relationship with an employer. Um, and this is why it's really important to have IP clauses in your commercial contracts. If you want to pass ownership of the IP to someone else, you would agree to assign your rights in that IP to the other party. For example, let's say you're a graphic designer and your client has engaged you to create their logo. They're probably paying you a large sum of money for that design, so it's likely that they will want to own any IP rights in that logo. You would achieve this by assigning to the client all IP rights you have in the design, this would mean that they can then do whatever they like with it, publish it wherever they like, register a trademark over it if they choose, etc. And you can't stop them because you no longer have any rights in that IP. It's important to note that IP can only be generally only be held with one party unless the parties have specifically agreed to be joint IP holders, um, which isn't something that we would recommend. On the other hand, if you want to continue to own the specific piece of IP, but want to give someone else the right to use that IP, you would give them a license. A license is useful in situations where it's not appropriate to transfer ownership of the IP, but you want to give the other party the right to use it. For example, because they're paying you for a fee for it, such as in the case of a SaaS platform. The benefit of a license is that you can be as restrictive or as broad as you like, for example, you could restrict the license so that the other side can only use the IP for a specific purpose or a specific time frame, or only specific people from a business can use it. Assigning or licensing your IP can be done through a specific IP assignment or IP license deed, which is mostly appropriate in an instance where you're transferring or licensing IP within members of the same group of companies or where you're selling or licensing IP to a third party, but there's no other services involved, and the fee is simply for the purchase of the right to use the IP. For example, you've already created a piece of software for some other reason, but you're no longer using it or commercializing it, and another party has approached you and offered to pay you a fee for you to assign your rights in that software to them. In that scenario, because there are no additional services, you're not um, you know, promising to maintain the software do anything extra with it, an IP assignment deed would be appropriate. Otherwise, where there are other services involved, for example, you're creating the IP for a specific purpose for a specific client, the assignment or licensing of that IP will be protected through clauses in your standard commercial contracts, such as your manufacturing agreement or your supply agreements.
Most commercial relationships will have some sort of IP involved, which is why every contract you enter should have an IP clause. In a contract, IP is often grouped together based on who owns it or who has created it. So you don't need to address every individual piece of IP you have. Your IP clause should set out who owns any rights in pre-existing IP. So any IP that each party has previously created and brings with them to the arrangement and who will own any IP rights and any new IP that's created as a result of the contract. This IP clause should also set out any licenses that are being provided in relation to each party's IP and any restrictions on the license. So for example, if you are a developer that has been engaged to develop an app, you may need a license to your client's pre-existing IP, which would include their app idea to be able to develop the app to their specifications. Where you have incorporated any of your pre-existing IP into the source code of the app, you would then need to provide your client with a license to use that source code. As we discussed earlier, by restrictions, we're talking about whether the IP license is for a specific territory, whether it's for the term of the arrangement or perpetually, whether it's sub-licensable or transferable, or whether there are any other restrictions on the use, on the other party's use of that IP. Your commercial contracts should also contain confidentiality provisions, which require each party to keep confidential any commercially sensitive information they receive during the course of the arrangement. This will take the place of an NDA and will help to provide extra protection for your IP. This is particularly useful, for example, where you've created new business processes as a result of providing a service to a client, such as a um, such as a new manufacturing process and you want to make sure that your client can't share any details of your new process with third parties. So that brings us to the end of the main part of the web webinar. I'm going to hand back over to Seidel to talk through some next steps. Thank you, Hami. So you might find our publication on trademark essentials useful and you can find it in the handout section of the webinar panel or scan the QR code shown on the screen now. We also have an upcoming event that may be of interest to you as well in the not too distant future. So on Tuesday the 20th of June at 10 a.m. we're going to be talking all about five essential contracts for your business and you can register following the link shown on the screen which can also be found on the resources section on the Legal Vision website. So we're going to answer your questions shortly and while you submit them We'll take a minute just to talk about membership with Legal Vision. So Legal Vision's membership is a cost-effective alternative to the expensive hourly rates you may have experienced with other law firms. And for an affordable monthly fee, you receive cost certainty and all-inclusive legal services. For example, that would include unlimited document review, and that would also include drafting, amending, and reviewing those items as well. So that could be um, items such as business contracts or commercial leases. It could be employment contracts or other types of contracts as well. So we'd review those for you as part of the membership. And as I say, we'd also look to draft anything for you should that be necessary as well. Your membership would also include unlimited advice consultation. And we have over 100 specialist lawyers um, that can provide advice on a wide range of areas of law such as corporate law, employment matters, it could be disputes, um, and it could be others as well. And of course, on topic, we'd also provide unlimited domestic trademark registrations as well, and advice upon that as well. And as a legal firm member, you basically would need to worry about the cost of lawyers again. And as I say, you'd have cost certainty. Think of it as having your, effectively having your own in-house counsel, where we take care of all the business as usual legal work and you can run focus on running your business and if you are an in-house legal counsel already yourself then our membership is a cost-effective solution for outsourcing any additional legal work that you may come across now to learn more about how our membership can help you please request a free consultation when the survey appears at the end of this webinar and so what we'll now do is look to move on some of to some of the questions that you've asked us today um, so I can see there's quite a few that's popped through. So we'll try and get through as many as we can. So the first question that's popped through is, can you trademark words or phrases? So it's a great question that's been asked there by one of the delegates. 
And the short answer to that is yes, you can, so long as words and phrases that are being used are not offensive, misleading, or something that's too common or non-distinctive. You have to always remember that the main purpose of registering a mark is to enable prospective customers to recognize your goods or services from those of another and to protect your brand identity as well. So an example of, you know, maybe some phrases that have been registered in the past could be such as Nike with Just Do It. So that is something that they've registered themselves in the UK. And presumably they would have also looked to register that across uh, the world as well. Um, maybe more domestically as well, we've got Tesco with Every Little Helps. So again, they register that as a mark as well. So again, if you wanted to use that, then you potentially need to seek permission from Tesco to do so. And further marks can also be found on the trademark register. So if you have a bit of spare time, then feel free to have a look on there to see what else is being registered as well. And ultimately, if those marks have been registered, that it is important to pay respect to the owner of those marks. And if you wanted to seek use of that, then you also need to look at seeking permission or a license to use those. Because if you didn't, then the enforcement that we talked about beforehand could be something that is used against you. So I can see a couple more questions have been asked as well about IP creation before the incorporation of a company. So I'll pass, my, pass that on to my colleague, Hami, to run through that. Thanks, Idol. Um, so the question was, what do I do if I created IP before I incorporated my company? That's a great question. Ideally, the company should own or at least have a license to any IP that it is commercializing or profiting from. If you created IP before you incorporated your company, that IP should be assigned to the company via an IP assignment deed. This will ensure that the company has the necessary rights to be able to license the IP to its customers, for example, in the case of a software, and will limit your liability personally should anything go wrong. Um, Saddle mentioned something a bit interesting earlier um, when talking about Nike. He said they've probably registered their um, slogan around worldwide. We had a question come through about um, what do you need to do to protect IP if the business is international. So I think that's a, a really good one that I'll pick up on as well. A lot of what we've discussed will still be relevant to an international business. One of the other things you need to think about is registering your trademarks internationally. Typically, when you register a trademark, you'd register in your country of incorporation where your business primarily operates. So if you're a UK-based company, you would um, primarily start with registering in the UK. If you later expand to other countries, you will need to register your trademarks in the other countries that you're operating in. So it's not like you can apply for registration in one um, country and be automatically granted protection elsewhere. Um, you will need to apply for the other countries and you can either do that directly, so apply directly to the country, similar to how you would with a trademark application in the UK, or you can go down what's called the Madrid Protocol Pathway which allows you to nominate multiple countries that you're interested in, in a single application, provided that those additional countries are all a party to the Madrid Protocol. Um, so it is quite important if you are expanding internationally to have a think about international trademark registrations um, and think about them early, even if you're starting off in the UK, but you have plans to expand into Australia and New Zealand and the US. Um, you wanna make sure when you're setting yourself up here, that the brand name that you've chosen is available in those extra countries and the additional jurisdictions. Um, all right, what other questions have we got? Um, oh, this is a good one. Can I jointly own IP with another business? Now, this was something that I touched on a little bit earlier as well. Um, it is possible to jointly own IP with another business, but it's quite complicated and we generally wouldn't recommend it. It's typically cleaner to have one party own all the IP and then provide a license to the other party to use the IP. If joint ownership is the only option, then you need to have some really strong contracts in place and have a think about things like what happens if one party sells their business? Um, will the new owners have joint ownership? What, what can each party use the IP for? Can both parties commercialize and profit off the IP? what other restrictions are there on each party using that IP. Um, and it's really important to have that all set out very clearly um, in a contract so that everyone knows what they're getting involved in. Um, I think that's all that we have to, sorry, Seidel. 
Thank you there, Hami. So yeah, uh, just to add on to that, it, it looks as though that is all we have time for today. So after the webinar ends, a survey will pop up uh, where you can provide some feedback to us and we'd really appreciate it if you could take some time to complete this 30 seconds survey and then also maybe look to provide your contact details to receive a complimentary legal consultation from Legal Vision. And that way we can discuss, you know, how to protect your own such property and maybe we can dive deep into any further questions that you may have. So please make sure to take uh, the opportunity to uh, go ahead and use that. But otherwise, thank you very much for taking your time out to join us and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.